for the last 13 years in the National Hockey League and I still haven't got a clue about what the hell is going on. Somebody's gonna, someday I'm going to figure out what 212 means and 212 and 697 and 4, I have no friggin' idea what the hell's going on. But um, being Irish uh, uh, has, a, has its advantages in hockey, it really does, because I don't get caught up on the stuff that everybody thinks is important, but I'm not so sure it's that important. I don't know, I'll give you a good example. A few years ago, I was at a hockey conference in uh, Windsor, Ontario, and Roger Nielsen's finger I've spoken that there a number of times, and Scotty Bowman was there, and Scotty was going to talk about the Ford check. The place was packed, right? I mean, just packed. Scotty Bowman on the Ford check. <laughs> so they're all sitting there, and people just like you, from around the world, they're all sitting here and got their notebooks out. Scotty on the four check. So Scotty up he goes. He goes, okay, now on the four check, what we try to do in the is, right, is we uh, like to dump the puck in. Heads all go down. <laughs> dump. <laughs> this is good. Good here. Right? Right. I mean, in some ways, I've been really lucky, you know. Like, just in the National Hockey League, I got to work for a number of years with Roger Nielsen in Philadelphia and Mark Crawford in Vancouver, Mike Keenan, it was interesting, in Florida. <laughs> I was with Mike in Florida. I was with Jacques Martin in Florida and uh, with Jacques up in Montreal. And, uh, we also have Montreal for Andy Cunningworth, took over from Jacques. And of course, Guy Boucher, we had him in Hamilton with their, right? Do you guys actually believe that they know more about four checking than you guys do? Like seriously, do you actually believe that they know more drills than you do? Because if you think like that, you're sadly mistaken. Like, they're not coaching in the National Hockey League because they have better drills than you. Right? They're not coaching in the National Hockey League because they're able to figure out what the other team's doing on the PK better than you. <laughs> like, right? What they do, <coughs> most of the time, is they understand, or they try to get an understanding about what's happening between these two things here. Good luck. <laughs> and that's what I said some of the time. When, right? Because there's times when, you know, when we had Scott Gomez in Montreal, and I gotta tell you, I had no clue what was going on in there, man. It was hard to figure out. <laughs> to me, the most important piece of ice is the five inches in your ear. That's it. I mean right there. And hockey people keep telling me really important. Oh, the mental part of the game is unbelievable part of it, right? That 90% of hockey is mental. The other half is physical, right? I mean, I hear this all the time. And then you go out and you never work on the mental part of the game, right? So what I want to do with you tonight is, is uh, it'll take us at least 
two or three weeks to go through it all. <laughs> but we'll have bathroom breaks as we go along. But what I want to just try to give you a sense is, is the mental skills program that, that I try to work with or try to use when I work with teams. Now, we've got to try to condense this. Uh, in Montreal and in Hamilton with our farm team, I spend 120 days a year working on mental skills, right? So I'm going to give you 120 days stuff here in 40 minutes. So I'm going to right, sort of a little quick overview. Now, how to coach the psychological side of the game. Let me tell you first of all about what my job is. When I work with the Canadians or work with our team in Hamilton or with the Moncton Wildcats here or I go to Europe to see Lugano one week each month in Switzerland, my job is pretty simple. Being Irish, it's got to be simple. My, my job right, is to teach players to use their mental skills. So things like developing the right mindset. Because one of the things we know is players who succeed think differently from players who don't. Players who win think differently. Coaches who succeed think differently from coaches who don't. Right? So how you think is, to me, step number one. Right? Where's the Leaf fans in here? Hands up, Leaf fans. <laughs> now let me give you an example of poor thinking. Right? <laughs> when you pick that shirt out of the closet? <laughs> this is the year. Here we go again. <laughs> Guys, this is the year. Right? And I get all excited. How is it going to end? I, I'm sitting watching game seven. I can't believe it. I'm sitting watching game seven. Right against Boston. Like, did you? Like, I'm sitting watching this with a Leaf fan. And do you know what's scary? He act, what was the score? 4 1, was it? Yeah. Right? With what, eight minutes now? Yeah. He actually thought they were going to win. Like, like, what planet are you on, buddy? Like, what do the Leafs always do when they go? <laughs> I'm just sitting there going, come on, God, Johnny, put a real man. Right? That's bad thinking, right? <laughs> <laughs> See the light. <laughs> now, I'm not here to pick on Leaf fans, but you do know the difference between Toronto and Montreal, don't you? Hey, we meant by that great, but at least we have a colored photograph of the last time we won the cup. So, so how do you think? How to handle adversity, how to prepare for practice, right? How to think. So we spend, that's the first thing we do. Because if players don't think right, it doesn't matter much after that. How to set goals properly, how to have a plan, how to use self-talk, how to use imagery, how to concentrate better when you're playing against the Leafs in Toronto and every time poor BK touches the puck, they boo him. That's not nice. Right? <laughs> so BK's got a lot of, you know, and all that, okay? How to play with self-confidence, okay? All right? How to handle, how to play with control, and how to prepare for games. So these are the things that we work on. Now, let me tell you what I don't do, because what I don't do, of course, is what everybody thinks I do, right? Let me tell you what I don't do. I don't tell players how to play hockey. If you need an Irishman, how to tell you how to play, right? So it's not kind of my job. I couldn't care about what you do that I don't know. And I wouldn't insult a professional hockey, I wouldn't insult any hockey player by giving them a feedback on back on the four check here, right? You gotta be kidding me. So I'm not there to teach hockey. And I'm not there to psychoanalyze the players. This guy here plays for the Montreal Canadiens, if he scores 50 goals for us this year, but at 3 o'clock in the morning, every night, right in the morning, right, he gets up and runs naked through the streets of Montreal. I couldn't care less. That's somebody else's problem, right? 
My job is to help them play better. All right? So, right? And the third little thing that I'm, I don't do is I'm not there to be a crutch for players. In other words, the coach called you a stupid what? No. <laughs> like, I'm not here to do any of that. My job is to help players play better. So for me, performance is the absolute key. Every single person in the organization in Montreal or Hamilton or Moncton or wherever it is, performance on the ice is what matters. And everybody's job, right, is to improve the performance. That's why you start that's why you start and start and skates, right? Right? That's why the athletic therapy people are there. It's all performance related. So I'm not there to hold players' hands or do any of that. So my job is to encourage players and teach them to use their mental skills. Okay? So how do I go about doing that? What I want to do is, I'm going to, I apologize in advance, I mean, we're going to go a million miles an hour here. But what I thought I'd do is, I would just sort of give you a quick overview of what we do in a year, right? The thing that, that I try to do is, we try to, to follow a process. In other words, if winning and succeeding in hockey is all down to luck, then the Irish would be the best in the world, <laughs> right? We believe very much in a process. You teach skills, you teach players how to skate, you teach them how to shoot the puck, you teach them how to lift weights, you teach them how to focus better, right? So we follow a process, right? And coaches, of course, well, Sometimes they get into bad habits, like, well, it's just one of those things. You know, we got another game coming up, just suck it up. But wait a minute, where did you get this nonsense from? The plane crashed into the side of the mountain and 400 people are dead. Why would we bother investigating? It's just one of those things. <laughs> like, so in other words, we are very deliberate. There's a process that we follow. We teach players how to think properly. We teach them how to set goals. We teach them how to use imagery. These are really important skills. Some players have them. Some players don't. Some players have heard about them and so on. So really important to teach these things. Now, how do we go about doing that? Well, when I work with a team, right, as I say, I usually go in for a week each month sort of thing. Now, I'm a prof at the university in New Brunswick, and uh, you folks pay my salary, right? So, because I'm on the taxpayers' rules. So I, want, I don't want you to think that you're getting ripped off here. But I do spend 10 days a month away from the office <laughs> in Hamilton in Montreal. I just come back from Hamilton midnight last night. And then I spend a week in Switzerland and a week in Moncton. Right? So, and then I'm here tonight. So that's my 30 days, 29, 30 days for the month taken care of right there. We usually have a thing. So for example, when I work with, uh, with Hamilton, which is from there, we're working on goal setting this month. So that's the thing. We have short 10 or 15 minute meetings with the team to go over goal setting right before practice. <coughs> this is what we're working on. This is how you set goal, blah, blah, blah. Sometimes we meet in small groups. So sometimes we'll meet just with a PK, or sometimes we'll meet that with a, uh, a line or just the captains or whatever. We have mandatory one-on-one -on -one meetings. Mandatory meetings. So Brian Gionta comes and meets with me. One-on-one. -on -one. Now what the hell is Brian Gionta going to talk to me about? Right, he's got the money off the ladies with Palestine Cups. Does Brian Joanda have to go to practice? Yes, he does. Brian goes, gosh, you know, I just don't feel like lifting weights today. Oh, that's okay, Brian. Don't you bother lifting a weight. You know, it's up to you. If you feel like you need to lift a weight, you go ahead. But if you don't think it can help you, don't you bother 
lifting a weight. No, no, no. Those buggers are in there lifting weights, right? So where did we ever come to this mental skills nonsense of, we got the shrink here today. If you think he can help you, you go and see him. But if you don't, that's okay. He's there anyway, just in case. <laughs> where did this nonsense come from? Brian, you need to concentrate better. You need to work on your pre-game prep. You gotta do right. So we have mandatory meetings. I'm not there to psychoanalyze them. We're there to work on skills. And you know something? And this has happened in Montreal. Our players didn't concentrate enough. They weren't focused. They, weren't, they didn't set proper goals, okay? Right? Cost Joff Martana's job. Cost Randy Cunningworth his job. Cost Perry Perrin his job. Um, cost uh, our GM, whatever he's in Chicago now. He cost him his job. It's okay, Brian. You just whatever you like. It's okay. I don't care. Like my kids. I don't. I don't care. You know, like if you know my kids starve to death. You know, if you think you've got to work on this mental skill, you go ahead. But if you don't, it's okay. There's just way too much writing on this, right? So we we have mandatory meetings. Everybody comes. Some last shorter than others. Right? I mean, Kerry Price is a classic example. All right? I mean, Kerry will come in and if he's playing well, I'll say, Kerry, how's it going? He goes, Scotty, it's going great. Don't F me up. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Meeting's done. We're done. <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> That's fine. That's fine. He had the opportunity to speak, right? And boom. Become some, and some days we talk, and some days we don't, right? But it's not like, go to see the shrink if you need it, and you're the only guy who comes. <laughs> <laughs> right? So of course you're not going to come, right? right? <coughs> so we have man for meetings, very process-oriented, and I try to keep in touch with our players through telephone or Skype. Right? So that's how I go about my job. Now, Let's start with what we do in September. Now here's some of the things that we don't do all of these things. But here, by the way, I can possibly imagine that anything, any of this stuff might be any good to you. But if you'd like a copy of it, just send me an email, scotty at umb.ca and that'll, that'll get me. Right. Now, here are some of the things that we think about in September. Really for me, the main thing is just developing a winning mindset. And I, by the way, I really like talking about winning, even with kids. Oh, no, no, winning's not, and you can't talk about winning. <laughs> oh, yeah, you can. So fun, man. Yeah, like it's way more funner when you win. <laughs> I'm not talking about getting a victory. I'm talking about winning. Those are two different things. Anybody can get a victory. Just go out, slash somebody, break somebody else's wrist on the other team, all right, spear them, okay, and then you'll get the victory. You're not a winner. No, no. You got the victory, but you're not a winner. Let me tell you what winning is. Winning is when you're playing, say, in a final, right? And you win 2-1. And to win 2-1, the other team was unbelievably well coached. Great coaching staff, great parents, unbelievably good kids on that other team. Really skillful, tactically great, don't take cheap shots, right? Just outstanding young men and women on that team, right? And your team just finished a little bit in front of them. Holy moly. That's the greatest feeling <coughs> in the world. Because to beat that team, and they do everything right, they're top notch, top quality, and you, and your kids finished a little bit in front of them. What's that say about your kids and your program? Wow, you must be teaching those kids a lot of really good things. And, you know, <coughs> let me tell you where I learned that. Last year in Switzerland, during the lockout, now, I've been around hockey players a lot. I've seen a lot of them. And it's not often I get completely blown away. It's not often, right? In fact, this might have been the first time I said, there's a hockey player who can marry my daughter. 
But one's only 13 and the other's only seven. <laughs> Petit, Patrice Bergeron was our import player in Lugano. And he comes, right? Now he's playing in the Swiss Elite League, right? And he comes, Hein carries his own bag in, hangs up his, everything in his stall, is immaculate. Goes to the training staff, right? And goes, is there anything that you'd like me to do in particular? Like, where, where do you want me to put my skates if I need them sharpened? Where's my sticks? How do I ask for more tape? How do you do that? He then goes and asks the fitness and conditioning guy, my Swedish guy, is it okay if I go down to the weight room and work out? <laughs> no. Boom. This guy wins. Right? And he carries himself in a certain way. He works hard. He's great on his video. You know, right? Like, you don't hear Patrice Berger on a sex scandal. Like, seriously, in the scene, right? Like, you're looking at somebody who's going, whoever coached that person, and whatever program he's come out, right? He played in Bathurst, right? What an amazing job. Oh, those are the coaches who should be in the Hockey Hall of Fame. Right? I mean, what a wonderful man they've produced here, right? So to me, winning is doing it the right way. It's all about teaching kids really good life habits. So, thinking the right way. Holy smokes, I've got 15 minutes left, and it's September, and I'm done anyway. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> now, what makes, well, first of all, let's talk about what makes a, a, a winner. Now, I know you work with young, uh, you, know, with, with, you know, with young athletes, but I think there's a couple of really important little life lessons that we can learn about succeeding, right? Successful programs deliver, right? If you produce out of your program here really good people, really good young men and women, right, who go on and make a positive impact on society, that's what winners do. They deliver, right? They deliver. And you cannot produce a first-class car on a second class assembly line. In other words, if you do nasty things when you coach, if you use bad language on the bench, if you rip into the ref, right? If you're telling them, I mean, when the other guy's not looking, just do it, right? When you do that, don't be surprised that your players turn out like that, right? I mean, <laughs> I that. So, Teach good habits, right? Teach kids to be respectful. Teach them to work hard, right? The hard work comes before success. And unfortunately, at the university, for example, I mean, I see lots of 18 and 19 kids. I had 200 of them in my class this morning, right? <coughs> and if I gave them an A plus at the start of the class, they wouldn't come. Study, can I have an A? Yeah. A plus, <laughs> right? But what about working and learning and developing? Ah, no, no, I just want the result. So really trying to encourage this notion. This is what makes hockey just the best game, right? You've got to work hard. You've got to be prepared, right? And things don't come easy. So there are lots of really good life lessons to be learned there. Now, winners don't take <coughs> shortcuts, and they pay attention to little things. Right? Kids pay attention to little things. Teach them, right? As Patrice Bergeron taught us all, little things are really, really important. How you set up your equipment, how you carry yourself, how you talk to other people, how you think, right? So little things are important. Now let me give you an example. I don't know if you can all see this, yeah? What I want you to do here is I want you to read this sentence to yourself. And I want you just, it's not a trick or anything, why don't you just count the number of times the letter F appears in that sentence? Just count the Fs to yourself. Very simple. Finished files are the result of many years of scientific study combined with the experience of many years. Already, that's pretty simple. Now, how many people saw three Fs? Okay. Anybody see four? Yeah. Six. Six. All right. 
Anybody else say six? <laughs> now, how do you explain that you only saw three? Right? And when I look at it and I see this most days, I only see three. Right? <laughs> but, but I'm Irish. Well, what's your excuse? You don't know what an F looks like? <laughs> right? I mean, they're all there. But you just took for granted like, ah, oh, it's a simple, right? So little things are really, really important. Right? Mental skills are important. We say they're important, and then we don't work on them. Right? <coughs> so little things are really, really important. All right, let's go down business now. A winning mindset. What are some of the things? Here are some of the things that we try to teach um, our players. Five golden little rules. Remember in hockey, you get what you deserve. Unfortunately, the Leafs have got what they deserve. <laughs> They have, right? In other words, they give the puck out to the team who puts the puck in the net most often at one end and keeps it out of the net at the other end. I mean, you get what you deserve. Maybe in one or two games you get a bad bonus, right? But over the course of the season, you get what you deserve. <coughs> so here are five little golden rules to teach your kids, right? Number one little rule. No bad days. How many people here have never ever had a bad day coaching hockey? Every day's just been a zippity doo da day. You just bounce in there, the ice is perfect, and every kid's right on time. Right? Every pass is tape to tape, right? How many of you? Well, here's your first little rule. From now on, in hockey, you're never ever going to have a bad day. Never. No, you can't. You don't have bad days. One of the things we do at the start of the year in Montreal is we give out the schedule. And we say to the players, please indicate on the 82 games here when you're going to have a bad day. <laughs> because we won't play. <laughs> right? And I always fill minds in. March 18th. Very bad day. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? <laughs> So one thing, for example, we try to say, we tell our players is, I give them another example. I got a friend of mine, so let me tell you what he does. He works at a hospital down in Pittsburgh, believe it or not, Pittsburgh in the US. And there might be someone in here who does this job as well, I don't know. But he does heart transplants for a living. That's what he does, every day. Just like getting an oil change. Brand new hearts into people. Now, Imagine you're doing that job. Just imagine. So there you are, you've got all the fancy little gear on and the little goggles, right? And 21 other nurses or just or doctors are all just standing watching you. You've just parked your Porsche Ferrari out in the parking lot. And they're playing the music from ER in the back room. And then wheel in the patient. And I tell the kids this, right? You wheel in the patient and you pick up the bread knife and you go, Whoa. right? Stick a hand in, right? Go big or go home. So they start feeling around. And I was speaking to a Canadian medical thing a little while ago, and I said to those, and I said to them, I said, like, you know, I am so envious of doctors and surgeons because I've never met, and there may be some of them here, but I'm envious of you. I've never met a group of people who get paid so much for doing so now. <laughs> Seriously. Like, you stick, I mean, there's no way you're going to be stuck in there all day, is it? Like, oh my gosh, may I just can't find the heart anyway? There's Four things! Four! Right? They stick a hand and you feel around. It's not like you're going to be in there forever. Right? right? Just pull it out. There it is. And you go, you go, whoops, it's his liver. And he's Irish. So you don't need that. So you put it back in again. Put it back in again. And you pull out your old heart. Boom. Garbage can. You pick up the nice new heart out of the life bucket. You walk in front. Whoops. Splat. It's all on the floor. Can you imagine right now a little red heart just pumping on the floor there? Pump, pump. What's the rule here in Riverview? What's the rule down here when kids drop candy on the floor? Three second rule. In Ireland, we don't have that, right? We got the three spit rule, <laughs> right? That piece of chewing gum could be stuck on the pavement for six months. <laughs> so you pick up the heart. And you pop 
Oh, no, it doesn't fit, right? It doesn't fit because you used it to use a drop and span. So how do you get a, a big peg into a little hole? Bang! So you get your hammer out, bang, bang, bang. Now it's in, you start stitching up, you look at your watch to see how long it's taking you, because it's the United States and you're going to build, right? And guess what's falling in? The watch is in there as well. Needless to say, things have not gone well, right? This person has snuffed it. They're going to the big hockey rink in the sky. But your job's not done yet, right? Because you've got to go out the door and the person's family are all waiting there for you. Right? And they say, doctor, how did it go? Well, what do you do? Tell the truth, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> They're dead. <laughs> if that happened in the United States of America, what would happen to that doctor? He sued. Sued. Not one of you people would sue, but not one of you. You'd right? You'd come up and go, suck it up, doc. Just having a bad day. I have bad days all the time. Nobody sues me. Huh? In other words, and I say this to kids, right? <coughs> you can't expect some people to go along at this, this level and other people to popple along down here, going, if you make a mistake, I'm going to nail your ass. <laughs> right? Give you an example. No. He gets the phone call from Dave Nonis. Right? Dave was my boss, my boss in Vancouver. And what? The Leafs need him. Up he goes. Plays 82 games for the Maple Leafs. And I can fix it for you. Because I'm Irish. I got the fairy dust. I wave my magic wand. And you're going to be the first star. Right? Three goals a game. First star. Right? In 76 of those 82 games. Whew. Guaranteed three goals too. So that's 200 odd goals for you. Right? Now the other six are going to suck. Right? <laughs> okay? Go and play like Phil Castle. But... <laughs> <laughs> right? Did you hear the rumor about Phil? What is it? He's getting 8 million? Is that what it is? Yeah? Apparently, and I don't know if it's screwed up, but uh, apparently.